During the contact of that unexpected and lingering kiss, Mr. Verloc, gripping with both hands the edges of his chair, preserved a hierarchical immobility. When the pressure was removed, he let go the chair, rose, and went to stand before the fireplace. He turned no longer his back to the room. With his features swollen and an air of being drugged, he followed his wife's movements with his eyes. Mrs. Verloc went about serenely, clearing up the table. Her tranquil voice commented the idea thrown out in a reasonable and domestic tone. It wouldn't stand examination. She condemned it from every point of view. But her only real concern was Stevie's welfare. He appeared to her thought, in that connection, as sufficiently peculiar not to be taken rashly abroad, and that was all. But talking round that vital point, she approached absolute vehemence in her delivery. Meanwhile, with brusque movements, she arrayed herself in an apron for the washing up of cups, and as if excited by the sound of her uncontradicted voice, she went so far as to say, in an almost tart tone, if you go abroad, you'll have to go without me. You know I wouldn't, said Mr. Verloc huskily, and the unresonant voice of his private life trembled with an enigmatical emotion. Already Mrs. Verloc was regretting her words. They had sounded more unkind than she meant them to be. They had also the unwisdom of unnecessary things. In fact, she had not meant them at all. It was a sort of phrase that is suggested by the demon of perverse inspiration. But she knew a way to make it as if it had not been. She turned her head over her shoulder and gave that man planted heavily in front of the fireplace, a glance, half arch, half cruel, out of her large eyes, a glance of which the whinny of the Belgravian mansion days would have been incapable because of her respectability and her ignorance. But the man was her husband now, and she was no longer ignorant. She kept it on him for a whole second, with her grave face motionless like a mask, while she said playfully, You couldn't. You would miss me too much. Mr. Verloc started forward. Exactly, he said in a louder tone, throwing his arms out and making a step towards her. Something wild and doubtful in his expression made it appear uncertain whether he meant to strangle or to embrace his wife. But Mrs. Verloc's attention was called away from that manifestation by the clatter of the shop bell. Shop, Adolf, you go. He stopped. His arms came down suddenly. You go, repeated Mrs. Verloc. I've got my apron on. Mr. Verloc obeyed woodenly, stony-eyed, and like an automaton, whose face had been painted red, and this resemblance to a mechanical figure went so far that he had an automaton's absurd air of being aware of the machinery inside of him. He closed the parlor door, and Mrs. Verloc, moving briskly, carried the tray into the kitchen. She washed the cups and some of the things before she stopped in her work to listen. No sound reached her. The customer was a long time in the shop. It was a customer, because if he had not been, Mr. Verloc would have taken him inside. Undoing the strings of her apron with a jerk, she threw it on a chair and walked back to the parlor slowly. At that precise moment, Mr. Verloc entered from the shop. He had gone in red. He came out a strange papery white. His face, losing its drugged, feverish stupor, had in that short time acquired a bewildered and harassed expression. He walked straight to the sofa and stood looking down at his overcoat lying there as though he were afraid to touch it.
What's the matter? asked Mrs. Burlock in a subdued voice. Through the door left ajar, she could see that the customer was not gone yet. I find I'll have to go out this evening, said Mr. Burlock. He did not attempt to pick up his outer garment. Without a word, Winnie made for the shop, and shutting the door after her, walked in behind the counter. She did not look overtly at the customer till she had established herself comfortably in the chair. But by that time she had noted that he was tall and thin, and wore his mustaches twisted up. In fact, he gave the sharp points a twist just then. His long, bony face rose out of a turned-up collar. He was a little splashed, a little wet, a dark man, with the ridge of the cheekbone, well-defined under the slightly hollow temple. A complete stranger, not a customer either. Mrs. Verloc looked at him placidly. You came over from the continent, she said after a time. The long, thin stranger, without exactly looking at Mrs. Verloc, answered only by a faint and peculiar smile. Mrs. Verloc's steady, incurious gaze rested on him. You understand English, don't you? Oh, yes, I understand English. There was nothing foreign in his accent, except that he seemed in his slow enunciation to be taking pains with it and Mrs. Verloc, in her varied experience, had come to the conclusion that some foreigners could speak better English than the natives. She said, looking at the door of the parlor fixedly, You don't think, perhaps, of staying in England for good? The stranger gave her a silent smile. He had a kindly mouth and probing eyes, and he shook his head a little sadly, it seemed. My husband will see you through all right. Meantime, for a few days, you couldn't do better than take lodgings with Mr. Giugliani. Continental Hotel, it's called. Private. It's quiet. My husband will take you there. A good idea, said the thin, dark man, whose glance had hardened suddenly. You knew Mr. Verloc before, didn't you? Perhaps in France? I have heard of him, admitted the visitor in his slow, painstaking tone, which yet had a certain curtness of intention. There was a pause. Then he spoke again, in a far less elaborate manner. Your husband has not gone out to wait for me in the street, by chance. In the street? repeated Mrs. Verloc, surprised. He couldn't. There's no other door to the house. For a moment she sat impassive then left her seat to go and peep through the glazed door. Suddenly she opened it and disappeared into the parlor. Mr. Verloc had done no more than put on his overcoat. But why he should remain afterwards, leaning over the table, propped up on his two arms as though he were feeling giddy or sick, she could not understand. Adolf, she called out half aloud, and when he had raised himself, do you know that man? she asked rapidly. I've heard of him, whispered uneasily Mr. Verloc, darting a wild glance at the door. Mrs. Verloc's fine and curious eyes lighted up with a flash of abhorrence. One of Carl Junt's friends? Beastly old man. No, no, protested Verloc, busy fishing for his hat. But when he got it from under the sofa, he held it as if he did not know the use of a hat. Well, he's waiting for you, said Mrs. Verloc, at last. I say, Adolf, he ain't one of them embassy people you have been bothered with of late. Bothered with embassy people, repeated Mr. Verloc, with a heavy start of surprise and fear. Who's been talking to you of the embassy people? Yourself. I, I, talked of the embassy to you? Mr. Verloc seemed scared and bewildered beyond measure. His wife explained, You've been talking a little in your sleep of late, Adolf. What? What did I say? What do you know? Nothing much. It seemed mostly nonsense, enough to let me guess that something worried you. Mr. Verloc rammed his hat on his head. A crimson flood of anger ran over his face. Nonsense, eh? The embassy people. 
I would cut their throats out, one after another, but let them look out. I've got a tongue in my head. He fumed, pacing, up and down between the table and the sofa, his open overcoat catching against the angles. The red flood of anger ebbed and left his face all white with quivering nostrils. Mrs. Verloc, for the purposes of practical existence, put down these appearances to the cold. Well, she said, get rid of that man, whoever he is, as soon as you can, and come back to me. You want looking after for a day or two. Mr. Verloc calmed down, and, with resolution imprinted on his pale face, had already opened the door when his wife called him back in a whisper. Adolf, Adolf, he came back startled. What about that money you drew out, she asked. You've got it in your pocket? Hadn't you better? Mr. Verloc gazed stupidly into the palm of his wife's extended hand for some time before he slapped his brow. Money, yes, yes, I didn't know what you meant. He drew out of his breast pocket a new pigskin pocket book. Mrs. Verloc received it without another word and stood still till the bell, clattering after Mr. Verloc and Mr. Verloc's visitor, had quieted down. Only then she peeped in, drawing the notes out. After this inspection, she looked round thoughtfully, with an air of mistrust in the silence and solitude of the house. This abode of her married life appeared to her as lonely and unsafe as though it had been situated in the midst of a forest. No receptacle she could think of amongst the solid, heavy furniture seemed other but flimsy and particularly tempting to her conception of a housebreaker. It was an ideal conception, endowed with sublime faculties and a miraculous insight. The till was not to be thought of. It was the first spot a thief would make for. Mrs. Verloc, unfastening hastily a couple of hooks, slipped the pocketbook under the bodice of her dress. Having thus disposed of her husband's capital, she was rather glad to hear the clatter of the doorbell announcing an arrival. Assuming the fixed, unabashed stare and the stony expression reserved for the casual customer, she walked in behind the counter. A man standing in the middle of the shop was inspecting it with a swift, cool, all-round glance. His eyes ran over the walls, took in the ceiling, noted the floor, all in a moment. The points of a long, fair mustache fell below the line of the jaw. He smiled the smile of an old, if distant, acquaintance, and Mrs. Verloc remembered having seen him before, not a customer. She softened her customer stare to mere indifference and faced him across the counter. He approached on his side, confidentially, but not too markedly so. Husband at home, Mrs. Verloc, he asked in an easy, full tone. No, he's gone out. I am sorry for that. I've called to get from him a little private information. This was the exact truth. Chief Inspector Heat had been all the way home and had even gone so far as to think of getting into his slippers, since practically he was, he told himself, chucked out of that case. He indulged in some scornful and in a few angry thoughts and found the occupations so unsatisfactory that he resolved to seek relief out of doors. Nothing prevented him paying a friendly call to Mr. Burlock casually, as it were. It was in the character of a private citizen that, walking out privately, he made use of his customary conveyances. Their general direction was towards Mr. Verloc's home. Chief Inspector Heat respected his own private character so consistently that he took especial pains to avoid all the police constables on point and patrol duty in the vicinity of Brett Street. This precaution was much more necessary for a man of his standing than for an obscure assistant commissioner. Private Citizen Heat entered the street 
maneuvering in a way in which a member of the criminal classes would have been stigmatized as slinking. The piece of cloth picked up in Greenwich was in his pocket. Not that he had the slightest intention of producing it in his private capacity. On the contrary, he wanted to know just what Mr. Verloc would be disposed to say voluntarily. He hoped Mr. Verloc's talk would be of a nature to incriminate Michaelis. It was a conscientiously professional hope in the main, but not without its moral value. For Chief Inspector Heat was a servant of justice. Finding Mr. Verloc from home, he felt disappointed. I would wait for him a little if I were sure he wouldn't be too long, he said. Mrs. Verloc volunteered no assurance of any kind. The information I need is quite private, he repeated. You understand what I mean. I wonder if you could give me a notion where he's gone to. Mrs. Verloc shook her head. Can't say. She turned away to range some boxes on the shelves behind the counter. Chief Inspector Heat looked at her thoughtfully for a time. I suppose you know who I am, he said. Mrs. Verloc glanced over her shoulder. Chief Inspector Heat was amazed at her coolness. Come, you know, I am in the police, he said sharply. I don't trouble my head much about it, Mrs. Verloc remarked, returning to the range of her boxes. My name is Heat, Chief Inspector Heat of the Special Crimes Section. Mrs. Verloc adjusted nicely in its place a small cardboard box, and turning round faced him again, heavy-eyed with idle hands hanging down. A silence reigned for a time. So your husband went out a quarter of an hour ago, and he didn't say when he would be back. He didn't go out alone, Mrs. Verloc let fall negligently. A friend? Mrs. Verloc touched the back of her hair. It was in perfect order. A stranger who called. I see. What sort of man was that stranger? Would you mind telling me? Mrs. Verloc did not mind, and when Chief Inspector Heat heard of a man, dark, thin, with a long face and turned-up mustaches, he gave signs of perturbation and exclaimed, Dash me if I didn't think so. He hasn't lost any time. He was intensely disgusted in the secrecy of his heart at the unofficial conduct of his immediate chief, but he was not Quixotic. He lost all desire to await Mr. Verloc's return. What they had gone out for he did not know, but he imagined it possible that they would return together. The case is not followed properly. It's being tampered with, he thought bitterly. I am afraid I am in time to wait for your husband, he said. Mrs. Verloc received this declaration listlessly. Her detachment had impressed Chief Inspector Heat all along. At this precise moment, he whetted his curiosity. Chief Inspector Heat hung in the wind, swayed by his passions, like the most private of citizens. I think, he said, looking at her steadily, that you could give me a pretty good notion of what's going on if you liked. Forcing her fine, inert eyes to return his gaze, Mrs. Verloc murmured, Going on? What is going on? Why, the affair I came to talk about a little with your husband. That day, Mrs. Verloc had glanced at a morning paper as usual, but she had not stirred out of doors. The newsboys never invaded Brett Street. It was not a street for their business, and the echo of their cries, drifting along the populous thoroughfares, expired between the dirty brick walls without reaching the threshold of the shop. Her husband had not brought an evening paper home. At any rate, she had not seen it. Mrs. Verloc knew nothing whatever of any affair, and she said so, with a genuine note of wonder in her quiet voice. Chief Inspector Heat did not believe for a moment in so much ignorance. Curtly, without amiability, he stated the bare fact. Mrs. Verloc turned away her eyes. I call it silly, she pronounced slowly. She paused. We ain't tra 
The chief inspector waited watchfully. Nothing more came. And your husband didn't mention anything to you when he came home. Mrs. Verloc simply turned her face from right to left in sign of negation. A languid, baffling silence reigned in the shop. Chief Inspector Heat felt provoked beyond endurance. There was another small matter, he began, in a detached tone, which I wanted to speak to your husband about. There came into our hands a, a, what we believe is, a stolen overcoat. Mrs. Verloc, with her mind specially aware of thieves that evening, touched lightly the bosom of her dress. We have lost no overcoat, she said calmly. That's funny, continued Private Citizen Heat. I see you keep a lot of marking ink here. He took up a small bottle and looked at it against the gas jet in the middle of the shop. Purple, isn't it? he remarked, setting it down again. As I said, it's strange, because the overcoat has got a label sewn on the inside with your address written in marking ink. Mrs. Verloc leaned over the counter with a low exclamation. That's my brother's, then. Where's your brother? Can I see him? asked the chief inspector briskly. Mrs. Verloc leaned a little more over the counter. No, he isn't here. I wrote that label myself. Where's your brother now? He's been away, living with a friend in the country. The overcoat comes from the country. And what's the name of the friend? Michaelis, confessed Mrs. Verloc in an awed whisper. The chief inspector let out a whistle. His eyes snapped. Just so. Capital. And your brother now. What's he like? A sturdy, darkish chap, eh? Oh, no, exclaimed Mrs. Verloc fervently. That must be the thief. Stevie, slight and fair. Good, said the chief inspector in an approving tone. And while Mrs. Verloc, wavering between alarm and wonder, stared at him, he sought for more information. Why have the address sewn like this inside the coat? And he heard that the mangled remains he had inspected that morning, with extreme repugnance, were those of a youth, nervous, absent-minded, peculiar, and also that the woman who was speaking to him had had the charge of that boy since he was a baby. Easily excitable, he suggested. Oh, yes, he is. But how did he come to lose his coat? Chief Inspector Heat suddenly pulled out a pink newspaper he had bought less than half an hour ago. He was interested in horses. Forced by his calling into an attitude of doubt and suspicion, Towards his fellow citizens, Chief Inspector Heat relieved the instinct of credulity implanted in the human breast by putting unbounded faith in the sporting profits of that particular evening publication. Dropping the extra special to the counter, he plunged his hand again into his pocket and pulling out the piece of cloth fate had presented him with out of a heap of things that seemed to have been collected in shambles and rag shops, he offered it to Mrs. Verloc for inspection. I suppose you recognize this? She took it mechanically in both her hands. Her eyes seemed to grow bigger as she looked. Yes, she whispered. Then she raised her head and staggered backward a little. Whatever for is it torn out like this? The chief inspector snatched across the counter the cloth out of her hands, and she sat heavily on the chair. He thought, identification's perfect, and in that moment he had a glimpse into the whole amazing truth. Verloc was the other man. Mrs. Verloc said, It strikes me that you know more of this bomb affair than even you yourself are aware of. Mrs. Verloc sat still, amazed lost in boundless astonishment. What was the connection? And she became so rigid all over that she was not able to turn her head at the clatter of the bell, which caused the private investigator Heat to spin round on his heel. Mr. Burlock had shut the door, and for a moment the two men looked at each other. Mr. Burlock, without looking at his wife, walked up to the chief inspector, who was...
relieved to see him return alone. You here, muttered Mr. Verloc heavily. Who are you? No one, said Chief Inspector Heed in a low tone. Look here, I would like a word or two with you. Mr. Verloc, still pale, had brought an air of resolution with him. Still, he didn't look at his wife. He said, Come in here, then, and he led the way into the parlor. The door was hardly shut when Mrs. Verloc, jumping up from the chair, ran to it as if to fling it open, but instead of doing so, fell on her knees with her ear to the keyhole. The two men must have stopped directly they were through, because she heard plainly the chief inspector's voice, though she could not see his finger pressing against her husband's breast emphatically. You are the other man, Verloc. Two men were seen entering the park, and the voice of Mr. Verloc said, Well, take me now. What's to prevent you? You have the right. Oh, no. I know too well who you have been giving yourself away to. He'll have to manage this little affair all by himself. But don't you make a mistake. It's I who found you out. Then she heard only muttering, and Inspector Heat must have been showing to Mr. Verloc the piece of Stevie's overcoat, because Stevie's sister, guardian, and protector heard her husband a little louder. I never noticed that she had hit upon that dodge. Again, for a time, Mrs. Verloc heard nothing but murmurs, whose mysteriousness was less nightmarish to her brain than the horrible suggestions of shaped words. Then Chief Inspector Heat, on the other side of the door, raised his voice. You must have been mad. And Mr. Verloc's voice answered with a sort of gloomy fury. I have been mad for a month or more, but I am not mad now. It's all over. It shall all come out of my head and hang the consequences. There was a silence, and then Private Citizen Heat murmured, What's coming out? Everything, exclaimed the voice of Mr. Verloc, and then sank very low. After a while, it rose again. You have known me for several years now, and you found me useful, too. You know I was a straight man. Yes, straight. This appeal to old acquaintance must have been extremely distasteful to the chief inspector. His voice took on a warning note. Don't you trust so much to what you have been promised? If I were you, I would clear out. I don't think we will run after you. Mr. Verloc was heard to laugh a little. Oh, yes, you hope the others will get rid of me for you, don't you? No, no, you don't shake me off now. I have been a straight man to those people too long, and now everything must come out. Let it come out, then, the indifferent voice of Chief Inspector Heat assented. But tell me, how did you get away? I was making for Chesterfield Walk, Mrs. Verloc heard her husband's voice, when I heard the bang. I started running, then. Fog. I saw no one till I was past the end of George Street. Don't think I met anyone till then. So, easy as that, marveled the voice of Chief Inspector Heat. The bang startled you, eh? Yes, it came too soon, confessed the gloomy, husky voice of Mr. Verloc. Mrs. Verloc pressed her ear to the keyhole. Her lips were blue, her hands cold as ice, and her pale face, in which the two eyes seemed like two black holes, felt to her as if it were enveloped in flames. On the other side of the door, the voices sank very low. She caught words now and then, sometimes in her husband's voice, sometimes in the smooth tones of the chief inspector. She heard this last say, We believe he stumbled against the root of a tree. There was a husky, voluble murmur, which lasted for some time, and then the chief inspector, as if answering some inquiry, spoke emphatically. Of course, blown to small bits, limbs 
gravel, clothing, bones, splinters, all mixed up together. I tell you, they had to fetch a shovel to gather him up with. Mrs. Furlock sprang up suddenly from her crouching position, and stopping her ears, reeled to and fro between the counter and the shelves on the wall towards the chair. Her crazed eyes noted the sporting sheet left by the chief inspector, and as she knocked herself against the counter, she snapped it up, fell into the chair, tore the optimistic rosy sheet right across in trying to open it, then flung it on the floor. On the other side of the door, Chief Inspector Heat was saying to Mr. Verloc, the secret agent, so your defense will be practically a full confession. It will. I am going to tell the whole story. You won't be believed as much as you fancy you will. And the Chief Inspector remained thoughtful. The turn this affair was taking meant the disclosure of many things, the laying waste of fields of knowledge which, cultivated by a capable man, had a distinct value for the individual and for the society. It was sorry, sorry meddling. It would leave Michaelis unscathed. It would drag to light the professor's home industry, disorganize the whole system of supervision, make no end of a row in the papers, which from that point of view appeared to him by a sudden illumination as invariably written by fools for the reading of imbeciles. Mentally, he agreed with the words Mr. Verloc let fall at last in answer to his last remark. Perhaps not, but it will upset many things. I have been a straight man, and I shall keep straight in this. If they let you, said the chief inspector cynically, you will be preached to, no doubt, before they put you into the dock, and in the end you may get let in for a sentence that will surprise you. I wouldn't trust too much the gentleman who's been talking to you. Mr. Verloc listened, frowning. My advice to you is to clear out while you may. I have no instructions. There are some of them, continued Inspector Heat, laying a peculiar stress on the word them, who think you are already out of the world. Indeed, Mr. Verloc was moved to say, though since his return from Greenwich he had spent most of his time sitting in the tap room of an obscure little public house, he could hardly have hoped for such favorable news. That's the impression about you. The chief inspector nodded at him. Vanish. Clear out. Where to? snarled Mr. Verloc. He raised his head, and gazing at the closed door of the parlor, muttered feelingly, I only wish you would take me away tonight. I would go quietly. I dare say, assented sardonically, the chief inspector, following the direction of his glance. The brow of Mr. Verloc broke into slight moisture. He lowered his husky voice confidentially before the unmoved chief inspector. The lad was half-witted, irresponsible. Any court would have seen that at once, only fit for the asylum, and that was the worst that would have happened to him if... The chief inspector, his hand on the door handle, whispered into Mr. Verloc's face, He may have been half-witted, but you must have been crazy. What drove you off your head like this. Mr. Verloc, thinking of Mr. Vladimir, did not hesitate in the choice of words. A hyperborean swine, he hissed forcibly, a what you might call a gentleman. The chief inspector, steady-eyed, nodded briefly his comprehension and opened the door. Mrs. Verloc, behind the counter, might have heard but did not see his departure pursued by the aggressive clatter of the bell. She sat at her post of duty, behind the counter. She sat rigidly erect in the chair, with two dirty pink pieces of paper lying spread out at her feet. The palms of her hands were pressed convulsively to her face, with the tips of the fingers contracted against the forehead, as though the skin had been a mask which she was ready to tear off violently.
The perfect immobility of her pose expressed the agitation of rage and despair, all the potential violence of tragic passions, better than any shallow display of shrieks with the beating of a distracted head against the walls could have done. Chief Inspector Heat, crossing the shop at his busy, swinging pace, gave her only a cursory glance and when the cracked bell ceased to tremble on its curved ribbon of steel, nothing stirred near Mrs. Verloc, as if her attitude had the locking power of a spell. Even the butterfly-shaped gas flames posed on the ends of the suspended tea bracket burned without a quiver, and that shop of shady wares fitted with deal shelves painted a dull brown which seemed to devour the sheen of light, the gold circlet of the wedding ring on Mrs. Burlock's left hand glittered exceedingly with the untarnished glory of a piece from some splendid treasure of jewels dropped in a dustbin.